Uh, my goal for today is to walk you through uh, kind of how the adversaries think, uh, the security mindset, uh, and why security is challenging. Uh, I'm going to do so by starting first with discussions of computer security in the, or sorry, security in the physical world. So one of the things I do a lot is I teach undergraduate computer security courses, uh, and at the very beginning of the, the year I say, okay, well at the end of the year I want you to be uh, very well uh, able to think about computer security issues in the digital world. Uh, but right now, people under, you're starting from a point where you understand computer science a little bit and you understand the physical world. And so we're going to start off by understanding how to think about security issues in the physical world and then kind of how those lessons transfer uh, into the digital world. And I realize also many people here are already experts in cybersecurity legislation, but hopefully I'll provide a slightly different perspective from the, from the you know, actual the attacker's perspective and security. So, uh, I'm not sure which direction to point, but apparently the click. So a little bit about me, uh, just very briefly, I'm an associate professor in computer science engineering at the University of Washington, a visiting researcher right now at Microsoft, and also a member of the current class of the Defense Science Study Group, so uh, related to lots of DoD activities. Uh, grad school at UC San Diego, uh, before grad school I worked in industry doing computer security and cryptography consulting, uh, and then I just served some other fact, uh, you know, outside of computer science, I, I'm a certified yoga instructor and I used to teach karate. But. Uh, back to the topic at hand, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I suspect that we are. Computer security deals about computation in the presence of an adversary. I say that presence of an adversary because that's actually very important. Because what the adversary tries to do is it tries to take a system that was designed to behave one way uh, and force it to behave in another way. So computer security is computation in the presence of an adversary. For the purposes of this talk, uh, I will use the term attack to refer to something that compromises a security and privacy property of a system. Uh, and I just want to throw that definition out there because I, as I know as I interact with people in the government, sometimes the word attack means something different. Uh, in some cases, some people differentiate being attack, between an attack, which actually might cause some damage, uh, versus espionage, which might be to extract information. But for me, an attack is something that violates a security and privacy property uh, of the system. Uh, start off by saying that I actually am one of those people that believe that technology is a great enabler. Uh, it is through the use of technology that we can improve many aspects of our lives, from education to healthcare to work productivity and so on. And I don't want to stifle innovation. Uh, the second point that I want to make is that interesting and important computer security problems can arise almost anywhere where there is a computer. So anywhere there's a computational device, maybe it even is not connected to a network, uh, has potential computer security issues. So this talk centers a in many ways around the security mindset. Uh, the way I define a security mindset is by differentiating it between a traditional mindset. So a traditional mindset, uh, you know, if I were speaking to computer scientists, oftentimes is you're flipping through a newspaper or maybe reading your news online and you see a new product announcement. The traditional mindset is, wow, you know, this is a cool new product, I can't wait to use it. Uh, the security mindset is oftentimes, wow, this is a cool new product, I can't wait to use it, but I also wonder how I might abuse it. What can I do with this product that takes it outside of the way the designers intended? Uh, and that's a security mindset and something that we'll want to be walking people through, through today. So the outline of the talk uh, will begin by focusing on thinking about security in the physical world as an exercise to thinking about how adversaries try to design uh, attack systems, how people try to defend against them, and kind of how this is a continual process. Uh, then I'll move into some case studies of computer security vulnerabilities for non-traditional devices, uh, things that some people might not be thinking about yet, other people are, are fortunately already thinking about. And then I'll back up to some more discussions about threat modeling and how that can influence and help us learn to have the security mindset. So, uh, I'm also a big fan of active learning, uh, and I hope people don't mind being engaged a little bit. But on your flight out, uh, my understanding from, from Herb is that people were given uh, a thought exercise. Uh, and that exercise was to conduct a thought experiment for bringing onto the airplane an item prohibited by TSA regulations that could be used by hijackers. Okay, so I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to either find your notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to either find your notes or write down your notes uh, about how you would bring in, uh, you know,
something onto the airplane that's prohibited by TSA regulations. At least this was a thought experiment. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you carried this out today on your flight? Those are two different. No, we weren't supposed to carry. No, 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 no,
So, you know, let's just take, you know, think about that particular uh, threat or maybe the threat of someone trying to slip a knife through security uh, and how you would try to defend against that particular, uh, you know, attack, someone bringing a knife in through security. And so, um, uh, since people have been sitting a lot, I encourage you to now stand on uh, front row, turn to face the back row, uh, have new partners, and uh, kind of discuss how you would improve policy to protect against this. Uh, so, you know, how would people, okay, so how would you change the pra practices to try to protect against uh, the slipping of a knife through? Um, let's see, uh, I don't know, starting maybe uh, one of the groups in the back. Would you be willing to share? I don't know if we came up with a good solution. Um, I mean, generally we're saying if, if it's the case where you have a, it, the nail file is in the case, you can try and say that the device has to be taken out of the case and scanned separately. Um, and Brett mentioned proving that the device can turn on and off if, it, if it's been slipped into the actual case. Yeah, no, actually that's very good. And I think you hit on something that's, uh, uh, a very good point that we will come back to, which you said at the very beginning, not sure if you came up with a good solution. I mean, that's part of this exercise in the sense that uh, for any mitigation technique that you can think of, you can probably start to think of ways around it. Uh, maybe, you know, people probably don't like to be called out, but how about uh, this group some more in that direction? We were talking about a similar thing or additional um, training for the... Additional, for the additional training. So training is very, very important. Uh, so, and... We, we, so we, we said, or I said, that uh, um, basically we, don't, we shouldn't worry about the knives because uh, the TSA solved this problem by using the hardened cockpit doors because uh, the, the worst the knife can do now is um, stab, pa stab a few passengers and not pry the door open there and get to the pilots. So we sacrifice the lives of a few passengers. <laughs> But, well, but, well, but you realistically think about how it will play out and that they might stab somebody, but then they'll be subdued by the other side. Okay, it looks like you had... Uh, I was just agreeing that at some point there's a sort of physical limitation to what you can detect, and so you have to look at the before and after. You know, what is it going to do if it gets through and minimizing the effects of that and also trying to dissuade people from doing it in the first place and just accept that there's a, a physical limit in what you can and can't detect. Yep, so physical limit and what you can and cannot detect, uh, which gets to another point that I want to make sure to raise. And I think, uh, uh, was it uh, Jane? Jane? Yeah, Jane mentioned uh, earlier about, you know, there's no such thing as perfect security, uh, but, you know, if we can raise the bar and address the 80%. Uh, so the next question that I, I'm trying to figure out where to point. Um, anywhere. Anywhere works? Okay. So the next question uh, would, that I wanted to have was how could we bypass the protection mechanisms that we just discussed? <laughs> Uh, but I think that, as Jessica mentioned, maybe that's actually not a necessary step for us to do because as you were discussing the, you know, how you would defend against it, it sounds like groups are already coming up with points about how you know, maybe this defensive mechanism you know, might help address it, might help you know, raise the bar, but not, might not actually be sufficient. So I guess another uh, question that I did want to ask but after feeling the vibe of this room is that... Uh, you know, how can we ever be confident that we protected against everything? Uh, I think that, you know, having sat through uh, Jane's great presentation, the opening remarks, and uh, hearing kind of your feedback so far, uh, I think it's pretty clear that from the discussion that, you know, it's very hard to actually know, are we ever, can we ever protect against everything? Uh, or moreover, is it even possible to fully protect against everything? So we're not going to break out and discuss this. But I did want to come to one other question, uh, and that is kind of just open your minds to be as creative as possible. Uh, so question one was about hijacking, but I want you to think about all the nefarious uses you might try to do with the air transportation system uh, and what might the TSA procedures not protect against. And so kind of think, you know, okay, airline transport, transportation system, someone is trying to attack it in some way that might not necessarily be hijacking, or maybe it's a new clever way to do hijacking that we haven't discussed yet, uh, but kind of brainstorm this particular question. Um, so. Uh, and I invite you to form groups in whatever manner you choose at this time. We're back together as a group, and I guess I might ask this group around this side what kind of other stuff, stuff you chatted about. Bio biological weapons. They hurt us. <laughs> Human biological weapons. Protecting a person. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Are you, yeah. There's no procedure as well. Yeah. And it fits the classic definition of terrorism, right? You're inducing yeah. a degree of fear that would cripple airline travel if people thought that there was a risk of being affected biologically, 
on an airplane. And then, and, and some countries they have the, 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 the infrared thing, but we don't do that here. Right, yeah, that's good. right but, but we wouldn't do it either. Yeah. yeah, everyone talks about weaponization of the whole thing. You just, you got 10 willing suicide bombers, just go send them to West Africa, have them, have them get the bullet themselves and put them on planes. So we're starting to be pretty uh, scary at this point. <laughs> um, anyone else want to chime in? Uh, other other thoughts? Uh, yes. No. Uh, we were talking about the the people that have access to airplanes, and not necessarily the passengers that are fully screened by TSA, but you know, the folks that handle the food or the, the engineers that might need to come in on and fix the plane last minute, or you know, the people that are jumping fences and ending up on planes. <laughs> Yes, these are all very good, very good points. Um, yes? It's the simple thing of lasers, right? TSA can't prevent somebody at the end of Long Island shooting a laser up and blinding the pilot. They can react in response to it. FBI could, mm -hmm. you know, but can't prevent it. Yeah, great. So um, all very creative ideas, and I'm sure there are more floating out there, but I will you know, kind of end this particular uh, line of discussion now. Uh, there's a few things that I wanted to, to reflect on based off of what was just raised. Um, the first is, uh, you know, in thinking about these other types of attacks, you know, you raise biological, you know, chemicals related to that, all these things, uh, you know, it just, I wanted to use that as an opportunity to point out that attackers uh, behave in very kind of, uh, kind of out of the box ways, uh, and even if we haven't seen it, or and I'm a you know civilian, I don't know if we've seen it, but uh, you know biological chemical type attacks, you know through the air transportation system, these are things that could occur. Uh, other issues to think about are just maybe even just grounding the whole air transportation of the U.S. for six months. Uh, what would that do to our economy? Um, uh, John, I think mentioned other countries very briefly uh, in the terms of different countries have different policies for checking for uh, biological, if I interpreted you correctly. Uh, and I wanted to use that as an opportunity to talk about the interconnectedness of systems. Uh, so Jane mentioned as uh, question number one is how do you build a secure system from insecure components uh, for computer systems? Uh, the same thing applies for uh, for you know the physical world and computer systems is that this is actually a, a very complex systems of systems. We have multiple countries interacting. And so how could the policies in one country affect oh, what's happening in another country? Uh, same with multiple computer systems interacting. Um, I also wanted to throw out some other example attack methods that maybe you thought of, maybe you haven't thought of already. Uh, 3D printers, I think, is very interesting. Uh, some of you probably already heard a little bit about this. But you know, could, you know, as 3D printing technology gets smaller and smaller, could I go through security with a 3D printer and then print uh, a knife? Uh, or print a gun or something like that. Um, you know, uh, I think some uh, discussion came up about uh, insiders, so people who are working inside the air transportation system, the mechanics and people who are servicing the vehicle at the last minute, they could potentially be attackers. Uh, and you know, they may do it because they want to be an attacker, uh, or they may do it because their family is held hostage. But you know, we have to think about the insider attacks as well. Um, and I actually, uh, so that hits on the main points I wanted to get through that part of the opening, uh, opening intro. And so to summarize, uh, what this process has hopefully shown is that it really is a cat and mouse game where there's an ongoing attack and defend cycle. So we have systems in place that are designed to detect, you know, detect against you know, knives coming through the, the scanner, but that doesn't mean that it's completely effective. Uh, another point I wanted to make is that the world surrounding a technology can change, and that can change the threat. So for example, 3D printers were not commonplace years ago, but as 3D printers become more and more commonplace, they might create a new threat that TSA, when the rules originally were created, might not have thought about. I wanted to uncover or discuss the diversity of attack techniques. A lot of different techniques mm -hmm. came up here. Uh, the diversity of attacker goals. And so while we're easy to get stuck into thinking about a particular type of a goal, like hijacking an airplane and flying it in a specific place, uh, you know, attackers might have other goals. For example, a classic goal of terrorism might just be cause fear, and so the biological threat might be applicable there. Uh, insider attacks can be serious. Uh, security risk can arise at the intersection between different components of a system. So as, you know, as a passenger goes from one country and flying to another country where they might have different rules, security issues can arise there. And another point that I wanted to, to make uh, is that security is not just about preventing an attack from happening, uh, but can also, there's also a very big role for monitoring uh, and deterrence. And so uh, one of the things we also heard, I think it was uh, actually Amy, uh, Amy in your opening remarks talked about the FBI monitoring of 
you know, individuals before 9-11, uh, monitoring and computer systems can also have a very uh, valuable role. So uh, that was the close of the first part of my talk, or session, I guess I didn't talk as much as everyone else did, uh, on under thinking about security in the physical world and what can we learn about that to understanding the challenges of security in the digital world. I now want to move into some case studies of computer security vulnerabilities uh, with non-traditional systems. Uh, and I want to do this, in particular, I'm going to talk about medical devices, children's toys, and automobiles. Uh, I want to do this because I want to drive home the point that anywhere there is a computer, there is a potential computer security risk. Uh, okay, so uh, beginning first with medical devices. Um, this is work actually done in, in all the stuff I'm going to be talking about in this section were done in our research lab at the University of Washington. Uh, this one was done in collaboration with UMass Amherst and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So uh, while medical devices are becoming more computational and are starting to include more wireless communication capabilities, uh, here is a photo of an implantable pacemaker. Uh, there's also implantable cardiac defibrillators and so on. The implantable pacemaker is implanted in a patient's uh, body so that it can issue a small electrical shock to the heart to keep it beating correctly. Uh, the implantable cardiac defibrillator also has the ability to issue a large shock if it detects a potentially fatal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. Uh, the computation and wireless capabilities are incredibly life-saving and improve the quality of care for patients. And so making these medical devices computational uh, allows them to give better therapies to the patients. Uh, making them wireless allows for better uh, ongoing monitoring. So for example, a patient with an implantable cardiac defibrillator or pacemaker, uh, while they're at home, they might use a bedside monitor and that bedside monitor might, might wirelessly talk with the implantable defibrillator uh, and then send the information about taken from that implantable defibrillator to uh, you know, the medical device provider and eventually so the cardiologist can look at that data. The question we have, and this is uh, back in 2008, was what are the potential computer security and privacy risks with wireless medical devices and how can we go about mitigating them? And so the approach we took in our lab was we obtained an implantable cardiac defibrillator that was introduced into the US market in 2003. Uh, so at the time of our study, it was a current generation device, though not the latest generation. Uh, it had short range wireless communication capabilities. And we said, what might an unauthorized party be able to do with this device using their own equipment? And this again was a short range communication device on the order of 10 centimeters or so. But we found that we could use our own equipment to, for example, wirelessly change the patient's name uh, wirelessly change the diagnosis of the patient, uh, implanting hospital, and so on. Uh, we found that we can also wirelessly change this to therapies. So, for example, the amount of electrical shock that it would deliver. Uh, we could also wirelessly turn off and on the therapies. So, turning off the therapies means that if it's a pacemaker, it would stop issuing the small regular shocks to the heart to keep it beating correctly. Uh, and if it detected ventricular fibrillation, it would not uh, treat it and respond. And we could also we also found that we could force this device to actually issue a relatively large electrical shock. Uh, when we sent the appropriate wireless command. So I do want to bounce back up at a high level uh, and say two important things. One is that, again, security is about risk management, and I think that the risk to patients today is small. And so whenever I talk about these results, I want to emphasize the fact that these are life-saving devices and the benefits far outweigh the risks. So for example, if I had a medical need to get an implantable cardiac defibrillator, I'd have no qualms about getting one, including exactly the one that we studied. Uh, so these are life-saving devices and the benefits far outweigh the risk. Uh, at the same time, I mentioned these results. Uh, we did this research first because we thought it was important to uh, you know, understand what the issues would be. We interacted with the FDA, we interacted with manufacturers and so on to try to figure out how can we improve the security of future devices. And the second reason I mentioned this result today is because I think it's absolutely important to understand that computer security issues apply to all technologies. Uh, not just you know, what we tend to think about or what many people tend to think about being the laptop and the desktop and the servers in the cloud uh, and so on. Uh, the next example, uh, you know, children's toys, I'll say it's a toy example because it's also actually very simplistic, but we're actually starting to see increasing computation in, in the, the items that we give to our children. So there's an example on the right, uh, Video Girl Barbie, uh, it's a video camera in her, in, in the, in her chest, takes pictures. Uh, and there's also those uh, two toy, ro those three toy robots uh, with short or long range wireless communication capabilities. Uh, and we wanted to say, well, what are the security risks with these, these children's toys? We looked at uh, these two robots. These two robots have Wi-Fi capabilities. 
Uh, and I gotta advance the slide. Um, actually, okay. So these these two robots have wireless capabilities. Uh, they're designed for uh, telepresence. Uh, and to give you an example of it, if I recall the marketing around the the one on the right in this figure, the the kind of the the spiky, the one that looks kind of like a green and white robot. Uh, it is designed, for example, the the child will get this. It's an erector set. The child gets it, puts it together, connects it to their home network. And then when they go over to their friend's house, they can connect over the internet from their friend's house to their toy robot uh, and drive it around and make sure their parents aren't in their room. So, um, you know, this is, this is the, the, you know, kind of, you know, one example usage model for this. Uh, we found that it's actually very easy for an unauthorized party to remotely access and control these toys. So an unauthorized party over the internet to connect to the toy robot, drive it around, look at the video camera, listen to the audio feed, and so on. And you can understand why this might be a, an issue. Uh, and I think it relates to some of the points that we heard earlier that some companies, you know, there's, an 80, there's standard security best practices that companies could be employing that they aren't employing yet, uh, at least at the time that we did this study. Uh, and there are several conclusions from this. One is that security, uh, you know, one of my beliefs is that security is not necessarily in the forefront of everyone's mind. Uh, yes, when people are developing a new, uh, you know, Android phone app or uh, a new website, hopefully they know to think about security. But when someone is working on children's toys, you know, maybe they're an expert in you know, making fun toys, but they may not already be thinking about uh, computer security issues. Uh, so one of the lessons from this part. My third example is on the modern automobile. Uh, what some of you may know or, or may not realize is that the modern automobile is pervasively computerized. So there might be tens to even over 100 computers inside a modern car. Uh, and these computers inside the car are networked together. Uh, these computers in the car and the networking of them is actually incredibly valuable from a safety perspective and a performance perspective and, and kind of a, you know, uh, you know, entertainment perspective and so on. So to give you an example, uh, each, there might be a sensor attached, attached to each wheel uh, that is, as the wheel is spinning, will measure how fast the wheel is spinning and then send over the car's internal computer network the wheel speeds to another computer. That other computer will, will look, at, look at and compare those wheel speeds and determine whether one wheel is spinning faster than the other. Uh, if it finds that one wheel is spinning faster than the other, that's a sign that you're entering into a skid. And so the computer will send a message to uh, the brake controller and tell the brake controller to slow down the back right wheel. And so the brake computer now applies brake pressure to the back right wheel. And so this is an example of how uh, the computerization and the communication between those computers in a modern car uh, improves safety. And so it's very valuable from that perspective. Uh, the question we asked is, well, what about an adversary? What might happen if an attacker can get on the car's internal computer network? What might they be able to do? Uh, and the way that we, we, this work progressed in multiple stages, but the way we began this work was we said, well, there isn't actually an easy way for anyone to connect to the cars and comput comput computer network. Uh, and that's by connecting their own laptop or any type of computer device to the diagnostics port underneath the dash. So there's a very simplistic scenario, but there's a federally mandated diagnostics port underneath the dash that's used for emission testing purposes. Uh, and the mechanics also plug in if you bring your car in for servicing. And so there's a federally mandated diagnostic port underneath the dash. And we said, well, what happens if an attacker connects their own uh, hardware to that diagnostic port? They're on the network. What might they be able to do? Uh, as part of our research, we bought two 2009 edition modern sedans, identical make and model. Uh, we, this is a collaboration with UC San Diego. So the UW team bought one. We kept it in the Seattle. The UC San Diego team bought the other. They kept it in San Diego. And then we subjected these automobiles to a battery of experiments. Uh, this is a photo of our experimental setup. What you can see here is that there's the OBD2 port, the onboard diagnostics 2 port underneath the dash. We've connected our uh, laptop through that using some converter adapter cables. And then we found that with our own laptop, um, OK, we were able to you know, inject arbitrary commands into the system. So for example, one of our very early results uh, was we found that we could just easily set the speedometer to any value that we wanted. Uh, notice that in this example, the car is unparked, and there's no security talk uh, without discussion of you know, unwanted advertisements. And so, of course, we're advertising our website uh, on the dash. 
Uh, but in fact, we were found that we were able to affect an arbitrary control over, essentially arbitrary control over the dash, the vehicle lighting. So we could turn on and or off all the lights in the vehicle. So if it's at night, we could turn off all of the interior and exterior lights. So if you press the brake, the brake lights were not turn on. And we could start the engine, we could stop the engine, we could control the transmission, we could control the brakes, uh, we can control the passenger comfort settings, and so on. Uh, since a picture is worth a thousand words, I thought I'd show you a video. I haven't quite done the math to figure out how many words that is. Uh, but I'm going to show you an experiment that we did on a decommissioned airport runway. Uh, to get you a sense of this experiment, uh, one PhD student, Alexi, is uh, taking appropriate safety precautions. Uh, and there's a police officer there watching us too. Um, but he's going to be driving the vehicle. Uh, and he's going to get to 20 miles an hour. Connected to the car, as I described before, through the diagnostics port. Uh, is our laptop, uh, and Carl, another PhD student, is basically going to press enter on the laptop to send a message over the car's internal computer network to actuate the brakes. So let's see if we got the video working. Zero now. Okay, so he's so Alexi's going to be driving down the road. Hit the brakes at three, two, one. Carl's going to press enter on his laptop, and so uh, without Alexi. So uh, without Alexi ever actually uh, pressing on the brake pedal, you can see that the car was, uh, you know, you know, the car stopped the car. Uh, we also found that, well, maybe backing up a little bit on the properties of the automobile, we have the anti-lock braking system. So if you recall anti-lock braking, anti-lock braking is designed for when someone puts full pressure on the brakes pedal because they're, you know, concerned about the situation, but actually it might be safer to pump the brakes. Uh, what this means is that the brake computer has the ability to override the physical press of the brake pedal so it can actually relieve brake pressure and then reapply it on and off. Uh, we found a way to exploit that where we constantly release the brake pressure, uh, making it actually impossible for Alexi to stop uh, using, using the brake. And so we're going to go here. Let's see if this video works. Two, one, zero. So Alexi is going to be going up to 20 miles an hour. Send the packet at three, two, one, zero. And so Carl pressing. So you can hear Alexi pressing on the brake, but it's not actually stopping. You can see the end of the runway. <laughs> Getting a little close. Uh, numerous, safe, numerous safety precautions in place. So the parking brake on this vehicle did work. So the parking brake on this vehicle was under physical control. Uh, and, you know, there are parking brakes in modern, more modern vehicles that are entirely under computer control. Uh, and, of course, we only did our experiments at 20 miles an hour because we didn't want to go too fast. And I should also mention, we've talked with the manufacturers, you know, lots of people are trying to consider these issues. So, uh, next slide. So, what I just showed you was what an adversary might be able to do if they could connect to the car's internal computer network. Uh, and I demonstrated this by in a very simplistic setup, the adversary actually physically connecting their computer to that car via the onboard diagnostics port. So actually connecting to the car. Now we can go through brainstorming exercises where we say, well, how might an adversary get this capability? Maybe they would get this capability by being a valet. Maybe they're, you know, you know somehow otherwise have access to the vehicle. Uh, but we thought it was actually more interesting to say, are there ways for an attacker to get their own code running on the car and the ability to talk on the car's computer network without ever physically touching the car. And it turns out that there is. Uh, I'm going to try to describe a few ways that we were able to get onto the vehicle without ever physically touching the car. Starting first with the car's telematics unit. So for those of you who are familiar with telematics units uh, or are not familiar, I can give you a short example. You might think about things like BMW Connected Drive, Ford Sync, GM OnStar, and so on. A telematics unit essentially gives the car the ability to, for example, call 911 if it gets in an accident. You know, some, some caveats there of who they actually call. But a car, if it gets in an accident, can effectively call 911. What this means is that our vehicle, off the lot, without any modification, had a built-in cell phone chip inside it. Which means that our car, car was on the cellular network. It could call, effectively call 911 if it got in an accident. But that also means that anyone can call the car's phone number. And so that's what we did in our experiments. Uh, we called the car's phone number. We played the appropriate tone to switch to the in-band modem. So now we're back into you know, modem tones. Uh, we, buy, we found a, an authentication vulnerability. So we were able to you know, play the appropriate, appropriate modem tones to bypass the authentication vulnerability. Uh, we then found what's called a buffer overflow attack. So we played the appropriate modem tones to exploit that buffer overflow attack to get a little bit of small code running on the car's telematics unit. 
Now the car's telematics unit, because it's connected to the cellular network, has 3G data, we're actually able to open up, an, okay, we now have our own code running on the car. We're actually able to open up from this unmodified car, a connection back to our servers at the University of Washington to download additional code onto the vehicle. There's a much larger payload. And this additional code that we downloaded uh, was basically an IRC client. So our, our now car is now actually a, a member of our IRC bot network. Um, uh, and so now from our servers at the University of Washington, we can basically have arbitrary control over the vehicle and do anything that we could have done in the first phases of our experiments, you know, lights, dash, diagnostics, uh, lights, dash, brake, engine, and so on uh, from all over the internet. And we tested this from 1,000 miles away. So for example, we, at, from the University of Washington, we called the UC San Diego car, bypass the vulnerability, got our own code running on it, and then you know, honked the horn and those sorts, sorts of things. Why does it have an inbound mode? Uh, well, you can also think of other examples. So let's say that someone says, I've locked my keys in the car. They call the customer service, and the customer service will then car, call the car uh, and unlock your car door. Um, and so we explored, we explored several uh, examples of how this capability might be used by uh, you know, an adversary, an unauthorized party. The first is an end-to-end -end theft example. And so uh, to kind of give you the highlights of this example, what we do is we can call a car's phone number, exploit the vulnerabilities, get our own software running on the car, our car is now connected to our command and control network. And now we can say, car, give us your VIN, so we can figure out what kind of car it is. Car, give us your GPS coordinates, because it has GPS coordinates, so we know where the car is located. Uh, and then we can do things like we can, over the internet, unlock the car door, start the in engine, uh, disable the shift lock solenoid so the someone who's in the car can shift out of park, uh, and bypass the immobilizer, which is supposed to keep the car running without a key in the ignition. And so a thief can then, you know, you can imagine a scenario where a thief says, you know, I'm in this neighborhood, are there any cars compromised in this neighborhood? Okay, there is, can you start this car for me so I can drive away with it? Uh, so this is Francie, a PhD student in the lab at the time. Now she's now a faculty member, actually. This car has an IRC button on it that will let us communicate. So we've already compromised the car. Uh, this is a command and control system where we're going to, she's going to type in a command to start the theft program. And then it's just a simple matter of executing the theft program. So she runs a the theft program. Uh, you'll hear the car start. Can just drive the car away without a key. This is Francie, uh, and you'll soon see Carl. <laughs> uh, you see the doors have unlocked. Um, as like any good car thief, he's going to first buckle up. We heard about the importance of seat belts already. Uh, and you'll notice there's no key in the ignition. It's just out of park, uh, and the filming wasn't perfect angle, but now he's starting to drive away. Um, the other capability that we oops, uh, the other capability that we explored was an end-to-end -end surveillance example. Uh, you know, some people might call this more espionage than an attack, but you know, in the purpose of this context, I'm just calling this an attack. Uh, and in this example, uh, many of you are probably familiar with Bluetooth hands-free calling in your vehicle. Um, this allows you to you know, basically have your cell phone sitting next to you and you're using the, the car's microphones and speakers to have a cellular conversation. Uh, what that means is that there are microphones in the cabin. And so what we're able to do is after calling the car and compromising and getting your own software on the car, uh, we're able to turn on those microphones without any indicator in the vehicle at all uh, and eavesdrop on the communication. And so in this particular scenario, Alexi and Carl are walking into the UW car, which has been compromised by the folks in San Diego, and the San Diego people are going to be eavesdropping on the communication. So getting in the car, driving around. They came up with this kid all by themselves, by the way. Super excited that we finally kidnapped Yoshi. And so meanwhile, at UC San Diego, uh, Steve Checkaway is sitting in his office, and uh, one, he's starting to see the GPS coordinates of the vehicle. Uh, and you could imagine, for example, if you compromise many, many vehicles, only looking at the GPS coordinates of people that are parked uh, during the day at the Google headquarters and at night, you know, in certain regions where the CEOs happen to live and so on. Uh, but pretty soon you'll start hearing the audio that's actually recorded in Steve's office. So this is the, high, this is the quality of the audio that Steve, Steve is able to hear through the compromise. <laughs> King Bowser's going to be super excited that we finally kidnapped Yoshi. Okay. So, um, okay. So, what are the other? So, at this point, you might say, "Well, this is a very big concern." You know, I didn't care so much about the diagnostics port, but the telematics as an entry point where someone can compromise a car from a thousand miles away. You know, that's more concerning. And so, let's focus on this wireless interface. Let's focus on the connection between the telematics unit and the rest of the world and harden it there. 
to address that, uh, or I just wanted to point out that there are other components on the vehicle that an ad adversary might try to compromise. So for example, our car's CD player is connected to our car's internal computer network. Uh, and you know, you, you hear cars, for example, that you know, as they're going faster, the volume will increase and so on and so forth. And so our car's CD player is connected to the car's internal computer network. And so what we did is, uh, or Carl did, is that he wrote a program that given any MP3 file, uh, will output a Windows WMA file that will play perfectly fine on your laptop or your desktop Windows or Mac. But if you burn that WMA file to a CD and put that CD in the car, our car doors unlock. Uh, and again, we could have any other capability that we wanted. Um, I will also say that we, in doing so, we also modified the car's FM radio uh, via you know, an, an adversary so that the FM radio would wait for a particular trigger, a particular type of FM radio signal that's being broadcast by you know, nearby FM station and then deliver a payload. Uh, and we also wrote, the, wrote uh, attack capabilities, not on the CD player, but another one that after it delivers a payload, it completely erases any evidence of its existence. Uh, the, another example is a mechanics tool. So whenever you bring your vehicle into service uh, at the automotive shop, what they'll do is they'll plug in a tool to the diagnostics port underneath the dash. Uh, the manufacturer recommended diagnostics tool for our vehicle has a Wi-Fi interface. Uh, and so what would happen in the service shop is the mechanic would use their laptop, they would wirelessly talk to the mechanic tool, and the mechanic tool would send messages over the car's diagnostics port you know, to debug the service uh, issues and so on. And um, might now come as unsurprising to you, we found that we could compromise the mechanics, mechanic tool, get our own code persistently running on that tool, so then it would then infect any car uh, that it then later came in contact with. So the point of this is that even if you address the wireless interface, there, are some, there can potentially be some security issues. So uh, backing up and summarizing uh, this portion of the talk, I um, want to emphasize several things. One is that all technologies have potential you know, cybersecurity risks, uh, and this can include non-traditional technologies like cars, medical devices, and toys. You know, of course, we still need to address the laptops and the desktops and the servers and the you know, big data and so on and so forth. Uh, security risks can arise with technologies even if they don't have wireless interfaces. Um, and just some other meta points to make. So for example, it can be hard to know when a technology has been compromised. Uh, sometimes it can, I heard that you know, when I went out right before my talk, some discussion of attribution, but it can be hard to identify who the attackers were involved in this case. And that's because you know, if an attacker wants to, they can have some anonymity on the internet. Um, one point to make about the internet is that unlike the physical world where if I wanted to you know, do some harm to someone else, we'd have to be near each other, uh, attackers and their targets can be thousands of miles apart. Um, and again, some points that people here are probably already familiar with, but I think is certainly worth repeating, uh, that attackers only need one way to win, but defenders must try to defend against everything. Uh, and that's, what, that's one of the things that makes security challenging. Um, and then also there's a big potential, one of the biggest reasons I see for why systems are not being secured is that the designers of the systems did not anticipate the attackers or did not anticipate the attacker goals or did not anticipate the attacker methods. Um, and so for example, uh, in the automotive environment, I would say that the security of the automobile was, you know, 2009 edition modern sedan was roughly equivalent to the security we found in the Windows computers in mid 1990s. Uh, and if you think about the history of that in the mid-1990s, uh, we had Windows 95, computers were typically kind of used in isolation, and suddenly dial-up became popular. <coughs> People started connecting their computers to the internet via dial-up, and then suddenly they started to be compromised. And so there's a big wake-up call for Microsoft, uh, and Microsoft has taken serious steps to try to improve security. Well, uh, things like medical devices and automobiles and children's toys and any place else you see computation, they haven't necessarily received that same wake-up call. Uh, and so they haven't, not, some of them have, but not all of them have been thinking about, you know, the potential threats against their systems. Okay, so that ends the second part of my talk. Uh, and we have some time to venture, venture into the third, where I wanted to focus a little bit more, not technical, but a little bit more kind of structured about the types of threats and how to think about them. So just... Uh, Sure, this repeats, um, you know, uh, sure this is uh, familiar to everyone, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, traditional computer security people think about three primary goals, the confidentiality of the system, the integrity of the system, and the availability of the system. So, you know, can the person use the system? So, for example, can I use the brakes when I want to? Or can I access Amazon.com if I want to? Uh, or can I get power when I want to? We heard about that being an issue today already. Uh, integrity of the system. Um, 
uh, you know, for example, you know, as uh, Jane mentioned, you know, if you go into a hospital and they think you have one blood type, but the records, I'm not sure you have another blood type, that could be a, that could lead to a serious compromise, I imagine, though I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, okay, so threat modeling, I believe, is a good way to develop a security mindset and to kind of cultivate the ability to think like an attacker. And I know that we're going to get into threat modeling even more over the course of, of to, over, you know, of course of this boot camp. Um, so I want to go at a very high level. There's multiple ways to do this, but the way I like to do it is to first think about how do we uh, describe the system? You know, what is the system that we're actually analyzing? Uh, this is important because if we don't know what the system is, we don't, can't really figure out what's a real threat and what isn't. Identify the assets. These are the things we're protecting. Identify the potential adversaries. Uh, identify potential attack methods. And then also evaluate the risks against the system. Uh, and, you know, there's an unordered list of potential adversaries to think about. Uh, you know, friends could be adversaries, ex-friends, family members, consumers, suppliers, governments, activists, organized crime, business competitors, reporters. Basically, anyone who exists uh, could be a potential adversary. Uh, that doesn't mean they would, uh, but it means that there's a diversity of attackers that we need to consider. Okay, uh, and that brings me to the security cards. And so you all have a deck of cards in front of you. You may not have known this. And so this, uh, this slide shows, a, uh, you know, shows what some of the cards are. Uh, but let me go into a little bit more, more detail. Um, I should say that uh, you know, through our lab, we produce a number of things. We produce a game. Uh, and this is not the game that we produced. This is the this is a set of this is well. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, this is a computer security threat brain, brainstorming toolkit. Uh, we created it for educational purposes. We also created it for threat modeling purposes, funded by the NSF. Uh, it's uh, designed to be extensible uh, because there's you know no single deck can anticipate all the possible issues. And you can see there's some blank cards for people to write their own topics on them. Um, but we created this deck to help people brainstorm about computer security issues and to uh, and we use the physical deck as opposed to just like a website because there's a we find there's value in having a physical artifact so if you're meeting with someone and you, know, you want to have a conversation or you're doing a brainstorming thing in a class or in uh, you know kind of a threat modeling within a, within a company you can take one card you can pass it around you can read the front and you can read the back so I uh, just briefly want to touch on the suits uh, and the cards in them. So we have the human impact suit. Uh, that's the blue suit. And you know your cards might be sorted in, in different orders, uh, but there's a number of different cards in the suit. So uh, there's emotional well-being, so thinking about how the compromise of a security system could affect the emotional well-being of the users. And, you know, typically we think about money or we think about safety, but there's a wide variety of things to think about. Uh, financial well-being, so impact you know, people's finances, uh, impact personal data, impact someone's physical well-being uh, via compromising computer systems. So maybe you're thinking about a water treatment system. Maybe you hack the water treatment system and reverse the sewage and the regular water, contaminate the right drinking water system, compromise physical well-being. Uh, relationships, uh, you know, probably everyone thinks about Facebook and relationships, you know, how, compromising that system, what could happen to relationships. Societal well-being, the biosphere, and then unusual impacts that force people to, or encourage people to think out of the box. Uh, adversary motivations, uh, they are the orange, the orange cards. So uh, there's a number of things in this set that an adversary might be motivated by, and we created this so that people you know, are encouraged to think broadly about potential attacker motive motives. So for example, access and convenience. So an attacker might compromise a system simply because it's more convenient. Uh, you know, and it makes their life easier if they didn't have to, you know, type in their password every single time. Uh, curiosity or boredom. This relates very nicely to uh, kind of what Herb was talking about the beginning of at MIT, where sometimes people are just saying, well, what can I do? Um, Desire or obsession, uh, you know, cyber stalking, or various other reasons why an attacker might use desire or obsession. Uh, diplomacy or warfare, malice or revenge, um, financial motives, of course, money, uh, politics, uh, protection. So maybe uh, there's a computer system that provides some certain property, but um, you know, maybe some, uh, you know, think about you know, ch you know, children using the internet. You know, parents might want children to use the internet, 
Children might try to install some sort of anonymity system so their parents can't see them. The parents might try to bypass the system so they can watch what their children are doing so they can protect them. Uh, so protection might actually be a, a goal for compromising a system. Uh, religion, uh, self-promotion uh, also relates to what Herb mentioned earlier about compromising the MIT systems for kind of fame and notoriety and so on. Unusual motives uh, and worldview. So these are motivations that uh, an attacker might have. Uh, adversary resources, uh, they're the red cards. And so, for example, an adversary might have expertise. The adversary might leverage the fact that the world is changing so that when the future world, so that when a security system was deployed, uh, then the world suddenly changes. And for example, 3D printing becomes uh, very cheap. How does that change uh, the adversary's capabilities? Uh, impunity, so maybe the person has the ability to act from another country where there's no extradition treaties and so on and so forth. Uh, inside capabilities, we talked about the insiders at the airlines uh, and how you know, a mechanic might have extra more capability than someone else. Uh, inside knowledge, so someone might know more about the system than what the public is, is than what the rest of the public knows. Adversary resources of money, the adversary might just spend lots and lots of money to uh, help achieve their goal. Uh, power and influence. For example, if someone can influence another party. So these things relate. Anyone want to throw out a system that they want to kind of model with these cards or explore? Yep. Vehicle to vehicle technologies. Vehicle to vehicle. We were talking about that too. Okay, vehicle to vehicle. Um, any other things that are relevant to people's? Uh... Um, there's suggestions to have online voter registration mm -hmm. um, and legislative proposals for that. And then there's countries in the world where voting is already done online. Yep. And connecting the idea of integrity of information to the legitimacy of the democratic process is really important. And I don't know that legislatively those questions are part of the conversation around these legislative proposals. Yeah, these are very good examples. Um, any others? Okay, so we've heard two examples. Uh, one, vehicle to vehicle communication uh, and something related to um, online voter registration and online voting. Uh, both very good examples. Uh, I encourage you to, or I'm going to ask you, uh, to break into groups of three or four uh, and <clears throat> Uh, take the human impact deck, uh, the, the, the suit, actually, maybe is a better word, um, and uh, the blue one, and s kind of sort them in order of relevance to your system. Now, I have a big asterisk there because I don't think there's any specific right ordering, uh, but it's the, the blue deck, the human impact deck. Uh, but I want to encourage you to discuss you know, each of these particular uh, topics yeah. uh, in the context of the system you choose. Uh, so break into groups of three or four, and you can choose within your group to either do vehicle to vehicle or online voting slash uh, online voter registration. Yeah, Wait, so oh, we, we have to, we pick, should one pick one of those two? Pick, pick one of those two. So within your group, pick vo vehicle to vehicle or pick voting, uh, and then sort the, the blue deck in order of uh, relevance. So. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, come back together, and I know that uh, uh, I know that probably um, you know, I could ask, you know, did anyone find this process easy? Uh, but I think that the answer is no, uh, and that's one of the, you know, of course that's an important thing to know in the sense of how do you actually prioritize between these things. But hopefully also the process, you know, we've only very touched on it, but hopefully the process also shows uh, how, you know, the variety of human impact we need to consider uh, in designing these, in thinking about the security of these systems. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe uh, for some of you, uh, things that you might not have thought about as being important, uh, these cards have helped, helped surface. Um, any, anyone have any, you know, find the use of the unusual impact deck, the unusual impact card? Yeah, we yep. did. Uh, for, for, for vote, we looked at the voting issue and the unusual impact there would just be people losing faith in um, democracy and we thought that was a little unusual. Yeah, very good. <laughs> um, and Nicole, you mentioned also? Or? That was, that was yeah, also. our conversation. Okay. Um, uh, I guess uh, any group want to volunteer kind of the, the top three cards that they pick for voting? Societal. Societal. Personal data. Personal data. And unusual. 
and unusual, and the face. Ours too. Okay, very good. Uh, how about anyone? Anyone do V to V? Or people chose chose voting. Um, so, what kind of impact did you guys have for uh, for V to V? We had physical, societal, and then emotional and financial. Emotional and financial. Okay, so we start to see how other you know things besides just the most you know. So obviously there's one, you know, with V to V, safety is because of an important concern. But as you start to dive down, you see that there are other types of human impacts that can also be affected by the security of a system. Okay. Uh, so the next uh, little exercise I wanted to work on was focusing on the orange cards, adversary motivations. Uh, and for each of these cards, again, you can either pick within your group, pick V to V or uh, online voting slash online voter registration. And, you know, we're not going to get through all of them, but start picking some of these cards for adversary motivation and think about how, uh, you know, how, the, how there might exist an adversary with that motivation to compromise that, the system that, that you're thinking about. So, adversary motivations. Uh, anything interesting come up? That's an open question. How do you define interesting? Um, uh, unusual motivation. Yeah, so or unusual. The vehicle, the vehicle, I mean, what if you just wanted to cause traffic jams or do something? Yeah, that's boredom. Yeah, yeah that's true too. Flex, yeah. Flex their muscle, right? yeah, yeah. Vehicle to vehicle, just boredom, curiosity, just, you know, <laughs> fame perhaps. Um, Personal convenience, right? Wanting to run red lights. <laughs> <laughs> Personal convenience and running red lights. So I, I, I actually don't know the details of this, but I believe there was a technology at one point where, uh, you know, ambulance will turn green yeah. for you. That's right. And I think it's that you can buy, yeah, a light that would allow basically you to emulate an ambulance. Um, so, yeah, convenience. Um, that was actually in 2600 in the 90s. Oh, 2600. Okay. Yep, so that was something they've known since the 1990s. I don't know if they're any better or worse these days. Um, uh, how about for uh, electronic voting? Uh, you know, I guess, you know, did, did people find any of these cards not particularly applicable to electronic voting? Yeah, so that, I, I actually thought all, because voting is kind of like the apex, you know, predator. Mm -hmm. Voting for congressmen, you know, is, you can, any one of these could be a motive. Um, uh, I mean, obviously politics was, would be the first likely motive, you know, Different president than the one you wanted, or something like that. But uh, but yeah, you know, I could yeah. You know, if you watch House of Cards, you think that every last one of those is, is a possibility, mm -hmm. and then some. Very good. Okay, so I want to leave time for a Q and A. Uh, but thank you. Um, so there was another activity, but I think we can go ahead and skip this. But you know, if you're interested, and in, you know, uh, you know, you're, you're welcome. From my perspective, you're welcome to keep these decks. Uh, that doesn't mean, I also won't be able to do them away. Uh, but uh, another activity you, one is possible to do is to take the three adversary suits uh, and then use them together to try to identify, you know, who might the adversaries be, uh, you know, what, what their motives are and how they might operate. Uh, and, you know, this can be done in any, any way, you know, picking one card from each suit uh, and then saying, well, can these things pair together and so on. Uh, I should mention that this is not a replacement for a formal risk analysis or threat modeling effort, <laughs> uh, but this is really designed to help. Don't try this at home, kids. Yeah. Hmm? Don't try this at home, kids. Yeah, that's right. But, um, but I think it, it is really designed as an opportunity to kind of open the door to thinking about unusual types of threats and threats beyond what we traditionally think about. Uh, and so that's, that's the real motive that for us to create the deck and for also sharing it, sharing it today. Um, uh, just a few other things I wanted to mention. Uh, some of you might already be familiar with this, but this is called an attack tree. An attack tree, basically, at the root, or at the very top, you begin with something that you want to do as an attacker. Uh, for example, entering a bank vault. And then underneath it, you write each way you think you might be able to enter the vault. So through the walls, through the floor, through the door, through the ceiling, and so on. And then under each of those, uh, one can write, or you can write, you know, all the ways you might think about doing that. So how might you get in through the door? Uh, you know, defeat the lock or break the door, disable the, uh, the hinge, become an employee, all the ways you can think of going through the, into the door. And so once you've identified a security goal or something you want to protect, you can use this as a method to figure out well, what are the ways that someone might get into that. Uh, I actually like voting as an example. Uh, you know, 
I did not you know, put this in just in response, but uh, electronic voting. And so another thing that I personally like to do, again, different people have different strategies, uh, but try to create this big matrix thinking about all the pro properties that I want from the system on one axis. So privacy of the vote, you know, in some countries I shouldn't, you know, we really don't want someone else to know how I voted. Uh, integrity of the vote, you know, shouldn't be able to change the vote. Availability of the voting system. Uh, so for example, you could imagine that if you knew the uh, party makeup of a state, if you hacked only the electronic voting machines that is, you know, in a region that's dominated by one party, you know, then the region dominated by the other party uh, might have more of the votes. Uh, confidence in the election, uh, you know, faith in the system and so on, those might all be properties we want to achieve. And then along the other axis, thinking about how can each actor violate this property. So what might a voter do? Maybe a voter trips over the power cord. Um, you know, what might an election official do? What might a manufacturer do? And so on. Um, so some lessons at this point. Uh, security is not a binary. Uh, there's no such thing as a secure or insecure system. It's always, you know, secure against some adversary with these properties and under these assumptions. And so security is about risk management. Uh, there's a diversity of assets to consider, a diversity of adversaries to consider, a diversity of goals for both the system designer and the adversary, and a diversity of methods. Uh, and hopefully this discussion has shown the subtlety of, of security in general, but computer security. And I hope I've given you some, uh, you know, tools or different, you know, uh, ways to think about, you know, given a system, what might the issues be? Um, and so I might encourage, uh, and if, you know, of course, I'm not going to have you send me your reports, but um, <laughs> uh, this is something I would encourage you to try out for a little bit. And that is when you read the news, Let's say you see a new product announcement, you know, something from Apple or something from Google or Microsoft or whatever, you know, a new startup, whatever favorite company you have, uh, you see a new product announcement. And then I will encourage you to not just think, oh, this is cool, but to put on the attacker's hat and say, how might I abuse this? You know, how could I violate the security property of the system for my own benefit? Or how might someone else try to violate the property of the system and, um, uh, and you know, achieve something you know that I wouldn't want them to achieve. Uh, and I encourage you to do this in kind of an informal way, uh, in the sense that you know you see this product announcement, you think it's cool, and then you have an extra five minutes as you're walking to a train station or driving in the car or whatever, and just think about, okay, well here are the obvious things that I hope the manufacturer is protected against, and maybe now here are some more subtle things that, that you know maybe the the manufacturers actually didn't address. And so that's the ongoing practice. Um, and then, of course, I should thank all my collaborators. Uh, Medical Device Work with uh, UW, UMass Amherst, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, the toys with UW, the cars with UW and UC San Diego, and then the security cards uh, at UW. And so that, I guess I have 10 minutes. 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, have you contacted any of the auto manufacturers with the results of your uh, experiments? And you know, what did they say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've been actually in, in uh, I would say, fairly uh, pro, you know, extensive conversations with automat automotive manufacturers about the auto work, also discussing with the Department of Transportation and NHTSA. Um, and by and large, my sense uh, is that the automotive manufacturers are very, very concerned about improving security. Uh, and, uh, you know, someone made this analogy to me, I don't know if it's exactly right, but the time we did our study, uh, Toyota was in the news for unintended acceleration. And I was told that no one wants to be the next Toyota unintended acceleration. So if there is an issue, they want to address it head on and early. Uh, and so for my conversations with, with, with the manufacturers, you know, internationally, so, you know, you know, at, at, you, know at, you know, all the major manufacturers, um, they really are thinking about addressing security and how to do that. One of the, I guess, benefits of diversity in the marketplace is that something that affects one may not affect the other. But I wonder if you could speak to um, sort of the universality of those uh, buses on these vehicles, mm -hmm. the 1553 bus, for example, pretty common across yep. all vehicles. And so um, it, it is, it's almost an all or nothing sort of thing, right? And, and who from the industry is going to drive that change that right now is pretty common and universal for almost all vehicles. <coughs> yeah, so that, there's, there's many aspects of that question. So, uh, you know, at the highest level, one of the questions, one of the things that you point out is that there is, uh, you know, there's this notion of a uh, computer security monoculture, a computer monoculture. And the idea is that if all the computers are identical, if an attacker finds one way to compromise that computer, they can use that on every single other computer. And so there's this risk with this monoculture. And so the question, as I understood it, about the automotive environment is that there is some, uh, part, of it, part of your question was that 
uh, there is some uh, uniformity across manufacturers, and how much does that affect the actual security of you know the automotive industry as a whole? And this other part of the question was, if I understood correctly, was on you know given the fact that you know automotive industry is large, who is going to take a lead in moving that whole industry forward? Uh, on the first part, I would say that even though they share a same bus, a same communication network in many cases. Uh, we found that there's a lot of diversity in the actual components in the vehicle, uh, even to the point that the component produced in the 2000, maybe I forget what year, 2008 vehicle had a very different uh, uh, software than the com same component in the 2009 vehicle. And our, my sense is that this was because the lowest bidder for making the 2009 component was a different company than the lowest bidder in 2008. And so there was a lot of diversity within the vehicle. And so, for example, the techniques we developed for the 2009 car you know, might not have worked against a 2008 car, or might not have worked against a 2010 car. Um, and the second part about the, uh, you know, who's going to move the industry forward, uh, the US uh, SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, so I think actually have a different name now, uh, has a task force focused on security, uh, and as multi-vendor, like, you know, um, you know, the major automotive manufacturers are all trying to work together to see how can we improve security. It's tough, but they're working on it. Yeah. So what, what do we, can we take a cue? I'll, I'll sure. put, okay. Herb, I'll put you first, but just so everyone else feels like they get a chance in the 10 minutes, go ahead. And then I'll, I know Brett's hand was up, and anyone else raise your hand and I'll get you. I don't know if you can see. Jessica, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. I, I just wanted to note that notice that they're doing all of this stuff several years after they introduced onboard electronics. Um, and, and so the, this this phenomenon is, a more, is an example of a more general phenomenon that when every somebody puts some plants out of vulnerability, the first reaction is, well, why would anyone want to do that? And, and, and the answer is, there's a lot of motivations for, 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 for doing that. So. Mm -hmm. so I have then Jessica, and then Drew, and then Ryan. Okay. Um, well, you were speaking about buffer overflow in terms of being able to compromise the car via the telematics. But buffer overflow already has a very simple defense. Just turn on the outer space layout, right? So most of these things I'm thinking with the toys, with the cars, they have